She was released from house arrest at the weekend after her five-year sentence came to an end, but she faces fresh court proceedings in Iran soon. Mr Johnson said her continued confinement was completely unacceptable. Scotland's Deputy First Minister John Swinney has survived a vote of no confidence at Holyrood. He denied claims by the Scottish Conservatives that he'd failed to hand over key evidence to the committee examining the Scottish Government's handling of complaints against the former First Minister Alex Salmond. Football and the Premier League in the Premier League, Manchester City have bounced back after their 21-game winning run came to an end at the weekend. They beat Southampton 5-2 at home this evening. The City manager Pep Guardiola was full of praise for his opponents. We face the, the most brilliant and the best team. We have a face in this stadium in the competition. The first 50-20 minutes, they were just exceptional. Today the players up front make the difference. For the way they played, they were in crowd in the first half. In the second half, we're much, much better. In the Champions League, Liverpool have made it to the quarterfinals of the competition. They won their second leg match against RB Leipzig 2-0. BBC News. This is BBC Radio 4, where we'll have the sound of satire, courtesy of John Holmes in the skewer in 15 minutes. But first, the working-class raconteur Tom Mayhew returns for another instalment of his autobiographical stand-up show, Tom Mayhew is Benefits Come. Please take a seat, Mr Mayhew. How's your job search going? I turned up for the interview to be a makeup assistant at Boots and they laughed in my face. Ah, a great first impression. Did you get the job? No. They asked me my opinion of number seven and I thought they were talking about Cristiano Ronaldo. Never mind. I'm sure we'll find even more relevant and exciting opportunities today. After all, you need money to pay child maintenance. I don't have any children, Carol. OK, what about your smoking habit? Or money to go down the bookies? N no, What I... about your impending legal case? What? Uh, no, hold on. People who sign on aren't all this tabloid stereotype of what a working class person is. There's a huge variety to our lived experience. We aren't all numbers who could be shoved through a system through the same shaped holes. So, how about applying for this job in a Welsh coal mine? I'll take a look. I'm just sick of all the negative stereotypes and all the presumptions. It just feels so unfair, you know? Listen, don't get me started about stereotypes. Wait. Fatio El Ghori, the Muslim hijab wearing female stand up comedian. Have you ever been negatively stereotyped? Salama alaikum. Of course not, brother. Well, that's lovely to hear, mate. You're from London, right? That's right, yeah. I'm from the deep, deep Middle East of Hackney. <laughs> so, what did you want to be growing up? So, I don't know if you saw on the BBC, NASA's trying to recruit. Astronaut. Oh, I'd love to see you go to space. <laughs> no, I'm scared of flying. <laughs> nah, this is a BBC free documentary. <laughs> Fatia El Ghori goes to space. Yeah, so I went to a careers advisor. She said to me, what do you want to do when you grow up? And I said, I want to be an astronaut. And she was like, well, uh, to be an astronaut, you have to be very physically fit. So are you willing to go on a diet? So I was 12. <gasps> yeah, I was 12. And then she said, and then you have to be very good at maths. And then she looked at my maths grades and they were like low Bs and Cs. And she was like, you have to be, you know, getting like A's and all this and what. And then she was like, do you just want to do it to get famous? And I'm like, pardon? Oh, mate, all those famous <laughs> yeah. astronauts. I'm always hearing about exactly. them. I'm always seeing Buzz Lightyear appear on Celebrity Big Brother. Exactly, right. And doing Mock of the Week. How dare he? How yeah. bloody <laughs> they? So, yeah, she said that. And I was just like, what? Like, and then, you know, like it crushed me, you know, inside. And I was like, we had a big family and we had some great memories, but we also had really, really tough times. Do you know what I mean? And what she said just kind of fed into all those tough times and the things I felt about myself at the time. And I just gave up. Like, I was like, you're not good enough. You're not ever going to be able to do anything. And and stuff like that. So I think it's really unfair for people to say things like, oh, why didn't you, why didn't you just get a job? And it's like, number one, like you said, there was a recession and you might have other responsibilities at home or outside of it. What are we supposed to do? Just study and work? What about your comedy, if you want to do that? Are we not allowed to enjoy our life? You know, like those people that were kicking off about food parcels that were going out to people from the food banks and they had sweets and chocolates and biscuits and people were like, why is there chocolate and biscuits in there? Why is there crisp? Like, what? I don't understand. Are we supposed to live like savages? Like, 
because we're struggling. I don't get it. Like, should we? We're already suffering, and you want us to suffer more. Like, we're not allowed to have chocolates and biscuits and crisps. Like, really, really. Oh, if they're really poor, then they shouldn't have anything in their life that brings them joy. Yes. It's like, what are you on about, mate? Like, <laughs> we're supposed to be the fifth richest country in the world, apparently. Absolutely. It's like when people say things like, "Oh, these people on benefits, they live better than I do," and I'm like, "If that's the case, mate, quit your job. Yes. Like, if you really believe people exactly. on benefits have a better time than you do." Quit your job and see how it is. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. My name is Tom Mayhew, and you just heard my virtual audience. That's nothing to do with a pandemic, by the way. It's just that the audience haven't seen a working-class comedian before, so they're worried that I might mug them. <laughs> yeah. It's a cheap joke, sure, but it's all I can afford. <laughs> That's a weird stereotype that people believe about working class people, that, that we're more likely to steal things or more likely to be criminals. And I'm like, mate, rich people literally stole other countries. <laughs> <laughs> but I'd be lying unless I didn't feel a little bit out of place here. Like, when the show was commissioned, I told my grandma about it, and her first response was, what? D don't you mean Radio 1? <laughs> And I was like, no, no, it's, it's definitely Radio 4. And she looked confused for a second before saying, but that's posh radio. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah, I, I don't know why they've asked me. And she was like, no, why have they asked you? <laughs> In all seriousness, my family is my main inspiration for doing comedy, in particular my dad. He was always amazing with people, and growing up, I was a very shy, quiet person, so I always wanted to make people laugh and make people smile, just like he did. I can remember when my cousins used to come around, and my dad's a big guy, so he would walk around our house with three kids hanging off each arm. Sort of the attitude that's like, I can't afford to take you to a theme park, so I will become the theme park! <laughs> My parents always did whatever they could to help me and my brother. They always tried to do their best to give us a good life and to set us a good example. One way they did this was through this thing called, um, what's it called? Christianity. <laughs> <laughs> I'm perfectly fine with people being religious, but I just wish my parents would talk about it a lot less. <laughs> okay. Like the other day, my mum said grace before a ready meal. <laughs> I was like, Mum, God's got nothing to do with this. <laughs> well, my parents, they listen to a lot of really boring Christian music. Now, there is good Christian music. For example, I'm a big fan of Stormzy. I was tempted to buy my mum a copy of Gang Signs and Prayer and be like, Mum, you like half of this. <laughs> but it always feels to me like a lot of prominent people in the media who say they're Christian, they don't actually seem to be good people. People like Tony Blair said he was a Christian, and David Cameron said he was a Christian, and then Jacob Rees-Mogg says he's a Christian. Recently, Jacob Rees-Mogg said that UNICEF should be ashamed of themselves for delivering breakfast parcels to children over Christmas. And I'm like, mate, you're a multi-millionaire who gets annoyed when hungry children eat? <laughs> Like, that's not very Christian, mate. Like, I'm quite sure there is a line in the Bible where Jesus says, all rich people are pricks. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing slightly there. <laughs> As a feminist, I wouldn't punch Jacob Rees-Mogg because I think a woman should get the first hit. <laughs> For balance, I was told to write a joke about Keir Starmer, which I did, which makes the Radio 4 executive producers a more effective opposition than New New Labour. <laughs> <laughs> Being raised a Christian, though, that has caused me some problems, because in my life I've dated people of different genders. Like, I don't really mind what someone is, as long as they're not a fan of Paddy McGuinness. <laughs> Occasionally people say, Tom, does that mean you like having threesomes? And I'm like, no. I can't imagine much worse than taking my clothes off and having two people go, oh, that's a shame. <laughs> <laughs> but it, 
it did make it difficult, though, because I can remember when I was 10 talking to my pastor at church, and I said to him, if someone's a homosexual and they're a really good person, do they still go to hell? And he said to me, yes, anyone who's homosexual burns in hell because it's against God. And that messed me up as a teenager, because I'd find a girl attractive, I'd think that was normal, I'd find a guy attractive, and I thought that the devil was possessing me or some nonsense like that. Eventually, I got over it, and eventually, my pastor left his wife for a man. <laughs> Clearly, he just prefers to hot weather. <laughs> Despite being raised Christian, though, it was actually more difficult for me to accept my class than my sexuality. Like, I was happy accepting my sexuality when I was 20, but it took me until I was about 25 before I accepted I was working class. I think it's because when you're LGBT, there's all these big things where there's big celebrations, people being like, be you, you're beautiful, you're great. But you don't get that if you're skin. Like, there's no such thing as a poor pride. <laughs> People saying things like, what do we want? More money. <laughs> when do we want it? In less than six weeks. <laughs> As a teenager, my mum worked at Boots, my older brother at Tesco and my dad in a warehouse. But I genuinely used to think, oh, we can't be working class because my parents work hard. Because that's a narrative you're taught. You're taught, if you're poor, it's because you haven't worked hard enough. I've also had it after gigs when people have said things like, Tom, I didn't think you were working class because you seem quite intelligent, quite educated. <laughs> and I'm like, mate, working class people can be intelligent and educated and interesting. Like, have you not seen Top Cat? <laughs> If you've not seen Top Cat, basically, uh, think your favourite cat. He's above that one. Because <laughs> there's a lot of stigma attached to being poor. You saw that earlier this year when people were defending the government's poultry food parcels by saying, oh, we, we can't give them vouchers or they'll spend it on drugs. And I'm like, mate, have you ever tried to buy drugs with a voucher? <laughs> As if someone's going to go, oh, yeah, it's either 50 quid or 500 computer for school vouchers. <laughs> also, it's like, mate, you gave them a mouldy orange. Like, I'm quite sure a gram of cocaine would have more nutritional value. <laughs> Ultimately, though, I'm just I'm tired of the negative stereotypes. I'm tired of the media coverage that labels all working class people as one mass and says that we should both know our place, but also be ashamed by it. I'm tired of this sort of idea that, you know, it judges everyone as good or bad, right or wrong. And uh, this is epitomised by my grandma. She was one of my favourite people in the whole world. She was witty, loving and intelligent. She believed in Christianity, in doing anything for her family and in putting others first. Conversely, she also believed a lot of what she read in the Daily Mail. <laughs> She thought there were three evil people ever, Hitler, Stalin and Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> she voted for Brexit and she thought that Boris Johnson was doing a great job. <laughs> it's not a good sign when some people laugh at that, is that? <laughs> and there'll be some people who sort of think, oh, I bet you had some big arguments over the years. And it's like, no, we... We didn't. Like, every time I saw my grandma, we made each other laugh and we made each other smile. And she sadly passed away last year. But when she was in hospital, I couldn't go visit her. So for the first time in 15 years, I prayed. I prayed for her. I asked for her either to get better or for her to be looked after when she wasn't here. I prayed to a God that I don't believe in because my love for my grandma is stronger than any of my beliefs. Ultimately, our beliefs and backgrounds, they do play a part in shaping who we are but they are not who we are. There are horrible Brexiteers, and then there's people like my grandma. There are good Christians, and then there's Jacob rees mogg <laughs> <laughs> And you know what? I can't believe in Christianity. I can't. It's just not how I'm wired. But I truly hope I'm wrong. I really do, because... I would love nothing more than the thought of my grandma up there with her feet up, drinking a cup of tea, listening to her grandson on posh radio. Thank you for listening. God bless. <laughs>
Tom Mayhew is Benefit Scum is written and performed by Tom Mayhew with additional material from Olivia Phipps. It featured Fatia El Ghori and Amy Gledhill. The producer is Benjamin Sutton and it's a BBC Studios production. So that's all for today. Make sure you apply for that job I recommended earlier. That job doesn't exist, Carol. Well, if it doesn't exist, you can't get rejected, can you? Oh, I knew I should have joined a union. And Tom will be back next week on, it says here, Posh Radio, at the same time for more tales from the Dole Queue. We'll head to Westminster.